Um, hello, uh, I'm Zachary Litchfield here with Bo and Yuan Ning to interview Dr. David Liptek. He's a wonderful composer and professor here at uh, Eastman School of Music. Um, so, David, uh, to start off, we wanted to uh, address this uh, sort of the ideas of inspiration and influence as it pertains to composing new music. It was kind of a common thread in the questions of, from the symposium. And um, uh, Yuan Ning is actually going to start us off with some of um, our first questions here. So whenever you're ready. Hi, David. Thanks for being us today. It's a pleasure to have a conversation and interview with you. I want to start our um, interview with a, with a pretty like um, broad question that um, what do you see for or focus on when creating music? I mean, what role does inspiration play in your compositional experiences? Okay. Uh, before before we continue, uh, I think Bo, if you I have hear, headset, if you have headphones oh, sure. or something, yes. Yeah, I can't hear myself. Same. Yeah, said it. Oh, good. That gave me some time to think about my answer. Um, uh, inspiration is a large word. Uh, I could mean many things. Mm -hmm. Most of the music that I write has some sort of relationship to something else. It's not, um, it's not in my mind, especially when I begin thinking about it and I begin to work on it, something that's an abstraction. Uh, although that is certainly part of what I imagine. I imagine music in abstract ways, notes mm -hmm. disconnected mm -hmm. from meaning in some, in some instances just a way of uh, playing with sounds. But almost all my pieces start out with some sort of relationship to either another piece of uh, art, uh, perhaps a poem, or maybe a painting, or some sort of photography, uh, uh, something with the written word. Uh, poetry certainly is a big part of uh, my thinking. Um, other times I find that I'm writing music that is so connected to music uh, which has already been existing in my life. And it can be older pieces, or it could be a piece of mine that I've written previously, or it can be something else which has uh, come my way. But uh, I find that um, um, I, I build my pieces in such a way so that there is some sort of relationship. The relationship may not always be a happy one. It may be that I'm writing a piece of music which is, um, in a sense, uh, an alternate view of what I understand from another piece of music or maybe an art piece that I've been thinking about. I'm writing something which is um, actually um, something which is not that which I am relating to. And uh, that's hard, of course, to describe because in the course of writing music, as you all know, it's complicated uh, putting the piece together and the piece emerges from a process which sometimes obscures the early thoughts of how it got, how it got going. Um, I would say that, um, you know, that's every one of my pieces that I can think of in the last however so many years has started out with an idea which is like that. Thank you. Um, I have another question that um, does the music of past eras influence your music language today? Um, if so, in what and which ways? Uh, yes, it does. I think because uh, of my um, experiences all my life as a pianist, uh, as one important part of who I am as a musician. And so I, I was once very serious about my piano playing, uh, but I still play the piano every day. And I, wow. I find a lot of option, I find a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for connection in the piano music of uh, composers of the past, especially Bach. Uh, there was a time when I was playing a piece of Bach, a different piece of Bach every morning when I woke up. And um, now I'm, I'm playing other music in addition to that, but uh, I try to play the piano for about 30 minutes every day and um, revisit the repertory, which is very important to me and try to learn some new pieces. Um, um, it's very traditional music. I mean, it's the stuff we all really know, both music from uh, the classical period and also the 19th century and then newer things as well. I think that um, probably the, the keyboard composer who has, or the composer who has most um, activated my imagination is Bach. I believe that um, some 20th century composers that have really influenced me are Bartok, 
uh, Luciano Berrio. And Luciano Berrio actually comes from a personal experience because I remember in 1969 hearing the Berrio Sinfonia when it was brand new. And it was only known in, form, in the four movement version by the first recording. But I remember listening to that piece when I was uh, about 19 years old and really, you know, being uh, awakened by it. It was just such an amazing thing. This kind of music uh, connection with past musics of, uh, um, of all sorts, actually, uh, appears in my music again and again. And uh, it's one of those inspirational connections that I spoke about when I tried to answer my first question. Uh, it's, it's something I do not suppress. I feel like my music is, uh, enriching, is richer by a kind of, by a relationship to the older music that I know. And it's, kind of, it's, not, it's not artificial, it comes from inside my own experience. All right, so um, one of the things sort of on that topic, it seems like a really direct way to connect your music with this past music is sort of through the use of quotation. It's like a really intentional manner to do this. Or um, I think I might have heard some things, but are there any uh, specific examples of quotation in the works that you presented? Uh, yes, there are absolutely. There are specific examples. There are specific quotations which are um, <coughs> not difficult to miss. Uh, not difficult to to hear, I mean, they're, they're difficult to miss. Uh, but there are other uh, kind of references to older pieces which are embedded within. Um, I, I think that um, not so much in these pieces that I've, I've, I've given to you. And then I think perhaps even more interesting to me is when my music is somehow uh, combined with some older pieces in a way which, in, um, which is meaningful to me and which creates something which is entirely for my uh, from my point of view, a new experience. Um, and that joining is, I think, uh, important to what I do. Um, <clears throat> and But getting back to a more specific answer, quotation has always sort of interested me. When I was a graduate student, uh, my first year of graduate studies, um, um, I went to, actually it was um, uh, a two-week session uh, with composers, and one of them was George Crumb, the other was George Rockberg. Both of these composers were teaching at, uh, at Penn then. But I remember that's when I got to know, I knew some of George Crumb's music. I knew Echoes of Time in the River and some other pieces. But when I went to a series of talks and in that week meeting, series of talks and meetings with him, I really got to know his music put in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, intense way. He had just written Ancient Voices of Children and he was, uh, he was composing, or maybe had composed Macrocosmos I by then, the piece that I later performed. Uh, and I was, um, you know, I was captivated. Um, quotation in that sense, you know, direct quotation was something I, I, I saw in his work and I found it to be something that I would like to try myself. So you sort of answered that my next question, but maybe, Refer, sort of reframing it um, in a way. So when I've considered like personally using quotations and things, but I always find it sort of musically difficult to handle. Like how obvious are you making the quotation um, when you are sort of making a statement, whether you're against or for it, how do you make that statement musically if you don't have words or something like that? Maybe some things like this. Um, yeah, it can, it can go wrong. It's like trying to write about humor in music. You know, sometimes he, funny music is really hard to write. And um, it, it's sometimes off-putting. It's so, you know, it's so out of place, it seems, unless it's done with a lot of intention and clar clarity. Um, the, uh, the guitar piece, um, uh, the guitar set of guitar pieces that I, uh, I asked, uh, I put on my listening uh, pieces uh, called um, the size is a seven movement piece, and I let I put two movements on online for you all to have a listen to, and one was called Les Soupirs, uh, which means the size, and it starts out with unambiguously with a uh, quotation from a piano piece, a piece not piano but for uh, clavecin by uh, Rameau, uh, which is called Les Soupirs, and it comes from the pièce de clavecin. Um, 
the um, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's exactly the same, except it's transposed and there are some modifications in the in, in that I had to make in in writing for guitar. But basically, the music is exactly the same, and it as that movement goes by, it sort of um, it sort of elides into music, which is not that, and it happens once. And we hear more of the quotation. We tell it's the quotation. We know it's the quotation, and then it elides away into the music that I've composed, which is not that. Um, and uh, that's how uh, uh, that piece is formed. It's very simply done. There should be no doubt that there are two kinds of music there. Um, other pieces are sometimes, uh, and the piece I did not show was my piano from my from my piano collection called Constellations, in which there are nine movements. Uh, in th um, three groups of three, and the third of each movement has a quotation from the music of Robert Schumann. In the first quotation, uh, it's a direct quotation of a piece uh, by Robert Schumann's, um, um, the, uh, sorry, I can't remember the name of the collection. It's, it's a direct quotation. In the second piece, it is a quotation which is uh, very short. And if you, you know, you know that it's a well-known piece, so you can't, you can't really miss it if you know the piece, but you can miss it if you don't. It's from <laughs> Prophet Bird and by Robert Schumann. And um, it's there, but then it disappears. It's just like a, a footnote in, in a way. And in the third piece, there was a quotation from the fantasy pieces, the early work of the, the fantasy pieces, which in which uh, it's, the fantasy pieces are embedded within the fabric of my music. And it's really kind of hard to hear unless you really know what you're looking what you're listening for so, so i think that's it's, it's an example of how you know in, in two ways i found that to be useful yeah so in that case you're like almost using it your handling of the quotation to control some of the form which is really nice um yeah, yeah also creating a kind of a subliminal right quality to it because you listen to it and you think you know there's something about that which is uh you know somehow you know it's catching my ear in some way uh, but it's all below the surface it's not that easy to identify yeah so it seems like your connection to other music is very intentional and sort of decisive um however i know personally like things get a little bit funny when sometimes inspiration manifests as subconscious proclivities or inclinations um and sometimes Personally, I haven't even noticed until someone else pointed it out, and then I was like, wow, you're right. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to see if this kind of thing has ever happened to you, and, uh, and did you welcome this, like, surprise? I usually welcome surprises. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just delighted when something happens that I didn't really notice. But uh, in listening to other music, uh, indeed, that's so. I have listened to music, and I've heard things or haven't heard things which were sometimes um, obvious to other people or hidden from other people's listening experience. Um, occasionally, and not too often, someone would come up to me and point out something in my music which they heard, which was a relationship that um, eluded me, or at least I forgot about by the time the piece had been completed. It was not something that was something that was in my listening experience. Um, and, and I'd always, um, Actually, I enjoy those those things when they happen because it uh, it sort of breaks me away from a certain way of listening to my music and then looking at it from a different view and trying to find out this person what been, had been listening to. Uh, uh, we all listen to music. It seems to me in different at, at different in different ways at different times in different uh, ways having to do with the level of attention, for example. You know, when you listen extremely carefully and you're and by listening, I also mean remembering what you've heard previously. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes you're very active with that, but sometimes the mind wanders and you miss things. And so we listen to music, we exist with music. We, I, I think the only thing you can say is we exist at the same time music is happening. Yeah. Sometimes we listen attentively, sometimes we listen with less attention, but still enough to follow the general outlines of things. And sometimes we're not attentive at all. <laughs> Well, in the sort of, I guess, reign of being attentive, um, some people notice some connections between Stravinsky and some of your works, and I think Bo is going to handle those next few questions. Yeah. Um, yes. So, um, 
May I ask um, if uh, Stravinsky's Octet for Wind Instruments inspire you in writing your octet? And, I, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, are you finished? <laughs> or should yeah, I? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes, that's, that's exactly what it is. Um, I was asked to write this for the Eastman Wind Ensemble group. Um, um, I've known the octet since I was a teenager. I mean, I really know that piece pretty well. And so um, I took on the challenge of writing this piece, which was a kind of a, um, a return to that instrumentation. Um, I think there are similarities to Stravinsky's music in that. Um, they're intentional, but I think that there are also some differences. Things have changed a bit. There's um, uh, another piece that I wrote about six or seven years later, um, which is uh, also a piece that derives from um, Igor Stravinsky's Listoir de Soldat. Um, this was written for a group called um, Deviant, Sex, uh, Deviant Septet, and it was um, a piece that was commissioned uh, by the Trusevitsky uh, Foundation. And uh, this was a longer piece in four movements, uh, making use of that instrumentation. So uh, I've had these two pieces together, which have been um, uh, my reimagination of Stavinsky's orchestrations. I think the octet is more like the octet of Igor Stravinsky than the other piece, which is called Focusing, which is a little less like, at um, least right or so that, more like some other kind of music, but having the same instrumentation. Of course, if you have the same instrumentation, you make associations pretty easily. Uh, so there's one movement, the second movement is called, of, of, of the focusing piece, it's called dance. And it starts out with uh, a violin solo, which is very reminiscent of the kind of violin writing that one finds in least part or so that. Um, the octet, I wanted to write a piece yeah, I think uh, this ensemble is very interesting to write for. Um, flute, clarinet, two bassoons, two trumpets, and two trombones, because it's so awkward in a way. It's you know, it's you, you don't have much. Uh, you don't have much. Uh, a lot of my music is smooth and and legato and connected. And you don't have much opportunity for that. These pieces are very pointed and sharp, and there's a lot of staccato and rhythmical activity. Um, there are some quirky things about it which happen. Um, um, I like to look at Stravinsky's scores uh, in, when I listen to music because this notation it is interesting to me because there are these, it's almost as if he has cut up pieces of his music and placed them around on his table and then put them together. You can see that in the scores a lot. And, um, and I find that to be an interesting way of working. So, um, you know, I really wanted to write a kind of a music which was like that. And so I believe that what I did with the octet may sound more like Stravinsky's music than what I did with the other piece. So sort of on that same topic, I was curious if, um, so like, did you also study his orchestration and like chord structure in this? Or were those sort of, was it enough just to do like sort of the rhythmic staccato things to get that? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I didn't so I didn't so much go back and study that in in an intentional way, study his music in an intentional way. Uh, although I did have the score at hand, so I could look and see what what was happening um, at a certain moment in a certain way. Um, but I didn't try to sort of um, analyze the piece to find chord structures and also orchestrations and try to imitate that from what I was looking at. Although I'm sure I carry in my ears that sound. And um, my writing process is one where I write things down and then I usually go to the piano and I do some checking and I, I look at that and I do some improvisation and see if it suggests anything to me. And then I repeat that process. It's a sort of a, it's my, my composing process is do, repeat, do, repeat, do, repeat until I actually get it right. right. And uh, so in, in doing that, I'm sure I was, so I was, transforming some of the scoring, some of the notes I had written so that it somehow matched the sound that I was trying to capture. And the sound of Stravinsky's music is in my ear. Um, but it's not an intentional kind of um, uh, studying, the, studying the score to the octet and then trying to adapt those 
uh, devices that I found into the music I had written. It was all from inside me. Okay. And may I also ask, um, in your piece Footsteps, were you inspired by any particular works by Debussy? Yeah, I, I, I think I was. Um, but this was commissioned for Debussy's 150th anniversary, and it's about a five or six minute piece, <clears throat> and it's in two parts. And the piece that we were, uh, we were actually asked to look at a specific prelude called Footprints in the Snow, uh, De Passe Sur la Niege. And uh, it's, it's um, if you remember it, it's, um, it's, it's from the, um, look, let me, let me just uh, share my screen for a minute because I made a copy of it. I found a copy of the score that I'd like to show you, so you just see what I'm talking about. And uh, this will take a minute. It'll be right here. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen for just a moment, my main. And this is the piece, this is the first page piece of this prelude. It's very well known, I expect that you recognize it. Um, and uh, all of us who were writing these WC pieces were asked to, you know, use this as a starting point. Um, most of the pieces that did use that as a starting point dwelt upon, and I'm doing, I'm circling with my cur cursor, the first, mm -hmm. first uh, figures on this figure, which begins things. Um, now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, having shown you that. Uh, well, I, I, did, I chose not to do that because I like other WC preludes better than I like that one. And so the piece I wrote that was Footsteps did not borrow any of WC's music at all. And in fact, it's, I'd be hard put to say uh, if, if there's any relationship between that piece and um, Footprints in the Snow. Which is which made its way and made its way into my piece. So that doesn't mean it wasn't connected. It wasn't disconnected from it. It was connected with that piece, but it was in such a way that um, I didn't. Um, I I decided not to use the material. There is something though that I did take from it that appears at the end of Footsteps, at the very end. Uh, one thing that I find interesting in Debussy's use uh, of phrasing is that often there is a short, probably one measure fragment of maybe two chords, which is stated and then repeated. This occurs with great regularity, I believe in his music. There's this first and second chord, which is repeated again. And this repeats are characteristic and I think of a lot of his music uh, that I played and know. And so you'll hear that in a in the figure at the very end. And that's about it. Okay. Um so before we sort of roll into, we sort of have a second topic area to talk about. I, I did want to maybe put a, a period on this inspiration topic by maybe asking for some advice, particularly in current times. A lot of students aren't really getting the same musical experiences they were. They're not able to perform in orchestras. Um, and some students aren't even getting the chamber music experience, even in smaller groups. And um, at the very beginning, you sort of mentioned that you pulled some externally, like inspiration from non-musics, from art and poetry and things. And it, it might be sort of really general to just ask for advice on how to find <laughs> inspiration. Right. Um, but I, I, maybe, maybe, maybe we can get some advice. Well, um, I, yeah, I can talk about myself, certainly. Right. I can also talk about my my colleagues and you know my composer colleagues around the world and also my colleagues here at Eastman, who uh, often say many of the same things that I say about how they relate to other art forms and how that it provokes their thinking about the music they're writing. So this, I'm I'm not special in this, but I think I am uh, specific in in some ways to some things. Um, I I found it. Uh, first of all, it's exhausting in our time, in this pandemic. The way we relate to each other and the way we teach and we learn saps our energies and it leaves us in isolation. Um, I think that's uh, 
I think that's a difficulty. And I think in making music, what I've heard from my friends and what I have in my own experience, that it was really difficult to start the work of composing um, in some ways that it hadn't been before. Um, I'm very happy to say now that about a month ago, I started composing in a regular way and, you know, and, um, um, you know, I've sort of escaped from that way of thinking. Um, and so it's been very good. And that itself is very healthy. It sort of kept me active. And I do this in the morning before I start thinking about all the dreadful things I'm going to be thinking about for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a scheduling issue more than a connection issue. But on the other hand, I think it's useful, and I had to tell myself this, I, I had to sort of you know, slap myself in the face in a way because I was saying, you know, in some ways what we are now is something I've just always wanted. I just wanted time to myself. I wanted expanses of time where I wanted to just think about the, the work I wanted to make and to actually do the work. Uh, and so, in making it that way, uh, you know, I look for things that often start me going on pieces. Right now, I'm reading a lot. Uh, I'm having uh, conversations with uh, composers who are old, who are older friends of mine uh, around around the globe, and we're sharing our thoughts about you know how, how we're doing and what we're writing. And uh, that community is is I think a rather important one, and I would I don't diminish that. Uh, also as an inspiration. And, um, you know, I'm, um, uh, I, I just think that it, it's, uh, you know, I'm paying more attention to uh, the kinds of uh, visual stimuli that compel me to think about music, uh, art pieces, uh, reading, um, and listening. Um, it, I didn't answer your question exactly. No, but that's, I, I, I went I, around it in a different way. I, it was yeah. a very personal answer. I had to do what I had to do in order to yeah. sort of find my own composing space. Well, I found it relatively in, in, encouraging just because I think I was sort of on that same timeline. I, I had a very difficult time composing until about a month ago as well. I felt that it was almost totally lost and so disconnected, you know, and so I, I think that's it's nice to hear that someone else also went through that. And um, okay, so let's uh, let's go on to our, our next <laughs> topic. So cohesion and clarity were words that were sort of used yeah. often to describe your music, and um, I think it's oftentimes sort of hard to. Maybe define that, and when it comes to music, one person's clarity is another person's chaos, maybe. <laughs> but um, um, I think uh, Yuan Ning is going to sort of start us off on on this topic. Yeah, like um, Zachary said, there are a few questions from the symposium team that involve the ideas of clarity and cohesion. Um, specifically, in your piano works, um, epithet and kinetic. Clarity is always presented. I mean, both of motifs and the textures. I want to ask that: um, Is there any advice you might have for composers seeking to make ideas in their work clear and understandable to the listeners? Well, I think that um, in what I try to do in writing those two pieces specifically was to remember that they were only a minute long each, and um, I felt like I had to focus on one particular and captivating idea, at least captivating to me, and really explore it and stick with it. Um, these pieces were um, memory pieces, two composer friends, okay. Stucky and Alan Schindler. A kinetic was written for Alan Schindler, and it's, you know, it's an interesting sort of memory piece in the sense, you know, it's, it's, it's lively, it's jerky, it's rhythmical, but it was, in my way of thinking, um, an apt, uh, an apt connection to how I, I how I experienced this person and what my memory was of working with him here at the Eastman School. So um, having found that general idea, I discovered these musics, this, this kind of motives which are very pointed and 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 I wanted to stay with them all the way through. Um, 
intervallically, there are limitations. Most of them, you know, there are a lot of sixths, for example, which are important in the piece, the intervals of a sixth. And I didn't deviate from that. I didn't want to change it very much, but I wanted to make it interesting for that one minute. Uh, and so there are all sorts of uh, disconnections and where things happen rhythmically. Things which happen rhythmically in the first statement of something are, are altered and changed and manipulated in the second. Uh, so uh, I, I try to be very careful about what I kept and what I decided to change. And I didn't want to cloud the precision of the idea by adding too much. With longer pieces, of course, the longer the piece, the more um, complexity that uh, is necessary, I think, to sustain a structure. But that thought of always being very clear in a sort of a phrasing and music and motivic sense is uh, something that I enjoy working on. Um, I try not to, I mean, I write counterpoint almost all the time, but I try not to obscure activity that's, uh, or rather I try to control the level of, of obscurity that you have, that happens when you write things at the same time. Um, when you have two different things going on, it's sometimes, you know, it, it not as easy to hear what the individual strands are as if they were by themselves. Uh, uh, if I really refer to another piece, uh, this um, uh, piece, The Sleepers, uh, which is for soprano and orchestra, um, there are two things I was thinking about, the soprano line and the orchestra. I wanted to have them fit together in a way which did not diminish the quality of each. Uh, when the soprano is singing, for example, I want the soprano to be heard. I want it to be there, even if the music mm -hmm. is complicated contrapuntally. Um, there are two ways that I did that, or I thought about doing the scoring. And one is very simple. When soprano is singing, fewer instruments play. And when there are gaps between the signs, which are with the parts which are sung, then I allow the orchestra to have a little more um, dynamic, a little more thickness, a little more complexity. But even when the soprano is singing over a sort of a complex texture in the orchestra, I'm very careful to um, double notes in the soprano in the texture of the orchestration. And not only or not even principally to give the soprano guides for the right pitches, but also to act, use the orchestra as a kind of a projection of the of the line that the soprano does. I learned this from st studying scores. Um, I remember Mahler particularly. But if you have, you know, a vocal line with orchestra, uh, the, you can double the notes that the soprano or the other singers uh, produce uh, with instrumental uh, parts. It is not something which, and I found that you can do it in such a way that you can, it doesn't obscure the line, but rather projects it out. It becomes easier to hear. Those are uh, things that I think about in, in the stages of the composition. I guess my mind is, uh, is more easily, I mean, I'm happier when I find music which is clear rather than, mm -hmm. um, 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 you know, uh, obscure. This is something that makes me happy as a composer. Sort of um, on that idea of, of you, you said you write contrapuntal figures often. Um, there's actually a question that was asking specifically on how you process the management of multi-voice passages. So you sort of described how you handle it in a sort of vocal situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed even your solo works have very sort of delicate contrapuntal qualities and things like this. <coughs> Maybe you can yeah. talk on that some, some more. Yeah, I don't have any um, particular method I thought on a point. Okay. Um, um, my music is not, uh, um, it's, it's, it sometimes sounds maybe like it's a little tonal and sometimes like it's not. Sometimes it's more organized into um, uh, uh, ways which are associated with other kinds of music than tonal music. Um, so I don't use a harmonic, you know, a plan that's the same for each piece. Uh, but I would say, first of all, I'm interested in things texturally and in terms of um, a kind of a way that the patterning of the music works, especially when writing for piano, 
Robert Schumann's music has interested me for this reason, how inner voices can be so beautifully written, uh, mm -hmm. shared between the thumbs, for example, the two hands. Yeah. And yet it's surrounded by other music, which is, uh, you know, all over it. So you have to play it carefully, so you bring that out. Um, but it uh, is a way of sort of interlocking, you know, the various lines together um, and making them work in that way. Uh, so, I mean, the ways of writing that, um, I, if I may just sort of imagine a way I've written that, and I, it's true, I've done music like this, but I'm making this up as I speak with you, it's not a specific piece. I uh, would enjoy writing contrapuntal music by, first of all, writing out a long uh, series of notes which uh, somehow uh, appeal to me. And then in a first process, just write that entirely true, uh, through. And then a second process would be separate out the notes so that it's kind of a hocket, one line in one voice, one line in another voice. So I transform that single line into to a, a two-part counterpoint. And then I would go, go to it again and I would uh, um, uh, very slowly actually, and as carefully as I can, uh, adjust what I have done. So it's not only a hocket, so it's not just, just a hocket, it's uh, actually two lines. I would do that by adding in non-harmonic tones, if you will, or connections, or removing notes, or having silences, but I would change it so I disturb the fact that it's just one line uh, written as a hocket, and now it becomes two independent lines in rhythmical and all sorts of other ways. Uh, if I'm lucky, that leads to something which has a clarity, which is satisfying. Yeah, that, that's great. I guess I, I, I never really thought to like take a single line in and make it into two voices. I think that's a really great kind of fun thing. Um, it, maybe, so the, in Les Soupiers and Epitaph, I feel like they have these sort of, maybe some of these pocket lines that you're talking about, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, when specifically addressing a solo piece, is is this sort of maybe the same process? Or I guess my question is, um, I have this sort of tendency when writing solo pieces to try and throw a bunch in because I need to fill in sound that maybe doesn't need to be there when you're writing these contrapuntal lines, you have these sort of interesting lines that maybe give you interest without the need of just unnecessary sound. Sort of how do you filter those ideas down into these clear, yes, into clarity, I guess. Yeah, I think I've been, uh, in, uh, in, in, for some years now, I've been doing this as a, as a sort of a, um, uh, I've been taking shortcuts. I mean, I know the kind of music that I want the sound properly, but I remember back uh, when I was searching for my way of writing, um, I also um, I also felt the responsibility of filling in everything. Um, I, when you write an orchestra piece, my first orchestra piece had so many notes, I can't, you know, I don't even want to think about it. It makes my head hurt. But, uh, you know, you, you have this obligation to write for everyone um, in the orchestra. You don't want to leave out, you know, the the third trombone player. On the other hand, if you get beyond that and think, well, I don't really have this obligation. I can, in fact, make the kind of music I want to make uh, in a way which is um, uh, less uh, n obligated to make sure there's always a lot of stuff going on all the time. And that, for me, was an important idea. It sort of allowed me to imagine music which was more chamber music, like when I write for orchestra. And that is my preferred way for writing for ensembles, uh, to think about it as chamber music. Um, I've written music which is not like that. I mean, it always depends on the, the, the task at hand. I mean, I've written wind ensemble pieces which are pretty thick and, you know, and have these large sounds which come at you and with many things going on. Uh, but that generally does not interest me as much as writing something which is very open and clear. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I invent techniques based on the problem at hand. Um, in, in some ways, I mean, one of, the, one of the techniques I really enjoyed, I wrote a piece about 25 years ago in which I wrote this music, which was contrapuntal, and then I, in my process, then I put, it, I put it aside and I came back to it, and then I erased half the notes, 
in all the parts. I raised them. And I did it in a way which was somewhat um, uh, arbitrary. I didn't allow myself to choose which notes to erase. I would say, I'm going to erase the third, the fifth, the ninth, the twelfth, and so on. I erased the notes and left gaps. And I found the music to be really interesting, just having done that. Uh, it is as if, you know, I, 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 this music was something that I had written, and it was from a long way off. And, and then I went back and I listened to it as if the, my radio signal was being distorted, was being blocked, and I was missing half the information. It's not unlike what we do on Zoom sometimes. It's not coming through clearly. And uh, just uh, reprocessing the music I had written to do these things, you know, opened up new possibilities for me. Um, and these possibilities align with my interest anyway, of making music which is uh, clear rather than uh, um, crowded. I'm trying to use the terms which are not pejorative, clear rather than crowded. That sounds like a little more empty rather than crowded. <laughs> right, yes. Um, so I guess sort of on this sort of use, this idea of clear rather than clouded, you also have some really notably short pieces yeah. in this in this thing. And, and, and maybe, um, Sometimes those are sort of dictated to us. You have to write a piece that's this length and things like that. But uh, maybe with works that you've had a little bit more creative leniency on the length, um, when is the decision of length made for you? Do you have a concrete idea of pacing and length at the onset? Or is it sort of like you let the piece grow and it eventually, here it is? Um, oh, I think it's a combination of those things. Okay. I usually start out with a piece um, mostly everything I've done has been for an occasion. It hasn't been just, you know, something I need to do, but it's been for a commission or else as a, a collaboration quite often with performers or in some other way it has been, um, you know, it has, it's a job which has been presented for me to fulfill. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to do that kind, kind of work to work that way. And within that, then I begin trying to write the piece I need to write. Um, however, you know, the piece does not always turn out to be exactly a good match for what happens when you write the piece. And so, and, you know, I allow myself to follow, if the piece needs to be longer somehow, but needs to extend further, uh, I don't stop myself because of some preconception of how the piece should be, which may or may not get me in trouble with the commissioning agency, but nevertheless, that's what I do. Um, I think also, um, you know, I enjoy the task of writing short pieces, and I enjoy the task of immersing myself in a longer piece, which takes more time. Um, mm, right now, I'm engaged with a 20-minute song cycle, and it's going to be in no more than five songs. So these are not smaller songs; these are larger songs. Um, often, uh, these longer pieces uh, uh, were uh, in movements. Uh, the longest single movement I wrote, I can't even remember how it was, but certainly it was not more than 13 or 15 minutes. I've never written anything longer than that. Uh, but longer pieces which have divisions within are something that I've done. Okay, well, um, great. So I think we've sort of maybe put a period on clarity at this point. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I really like some of the ideas of, of sort of <coughs> letting the work grow and just sort of your your own preferences kind of dictating the styles of the piece. And I think that that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, however, there was this one question in there, and I don't know if it was intended as a joke or, um, what, but it just was, what is your approach to orchestration? I don't know if you saw that question, yeah, I, but uh, <laughs> I, I sort of wanted to uh, address this this question because I think it's it's relatively important at least to me because I, I tend to uh, lean towards starting my ideas with you know sounds and maybe orchestrative ideas and I think um, Bo has a question that maybe can uh, address this specifically in in your guitar pieces. All right. Um... So I noticed that uh, in the sites, the solo guitar piece, there's a, 
um, co coherence of structure created by the use of guitar sonority and expressive imaginary. And composing for solo guitars could be really um, intimidating. So what's your process like for this piece? And did you experiment on the guitar um, and find out what sound you'd like to use for and how did the process contribute to the general coherence of the piece? Yeah, thank you, Bo. I, I'm not a guitar player. Um, I have written for guitar previously. I have two small guitar pieces, which precedes the size. And then I've written for guitar in ensemble um, a few times. Uh, so, you know, I, my, my knowledge is limited. Um, it's, an, it's an instrument which is uh, different from, all, from many others in the way it has to be considered. Um, there are lots of things you can do with the guitar which are, you know, kind of hard to wrap your head around if you're a pianist. I mean, it's, you, you sort of work it through by, by making the music. Um, the, uh, but I know what a guitar sounds like. And when I wrote the mm -hmm. size, I wrote it for a specific player uh, whose name is Dieter Hennings. And it was uh, written, uh, you know, with his playing in mind. I knew his playing, I knew what it sounded like, so I could, in my ears, sort of translate that into a kind of a musical notation. If I needed to, I could just imagine what the sound was like. Uh, however, uh, I did go to New York City and I borrowed my daughter's guitar and I brought it back to Rochester and uh, she let me have it very kindly. And I came back and I used it as a kind of a, physical resource because I, when I write music, I enjoy the physicality of playing the music and you know, singing and dancing and jumping around. But I like having the guitar there because I could really make, make those kinds of things. So I could feel what some things were like. Um, I also uh, taught myself how to play harmonics and I was captivated by that. That was a lot of fun. And I used that as a companion to writing the piece, following my ears about the sound and the music that I wanted, knowing what a guitar sounds like, knowing what his playing sounds like. I try to join that as much as I could with sort of imagine the feel of it. And I did change things based on my own limitations. Uh, Dieter's, Dieter has no limitations for playing guitar. He didn't do anything. So I could, I could really allow myself to be free and, um, and it, it seemed to be working out okay. Uh, but it is frightening to write for an instrument like guitar without that kind of uh, support. If I may say something, uh, if I may interrupt for a moment, I wanted to go back to something that Zach said um, before we go on from here. And you used the word preference, or I used the word preference. And I wanted to just say something about that word, because for me, it's been sort of filled with interest in, and, um, and, and um, questioning as all the while, as long as I've been composing, uh, uh, I've always been um, sort of balancing the idea of following my own preferences about what music should be with uh, a sense of a discipline that you get from having an idea for what the piece should be like. I think I probably have gotten to the point right now where I, the idea and the preference are much closer than they may have been in the past. Um, but I wanted to say it took me a while to sort of get comfortable with that. I always felt if I followed my preferences too closely, maybe I wasn't doing my job as someone who is pushing music out into different areas or exploring enough. Uh, on the other hand, if I didn't follow my preferences, it didn't, I never could get uh, the idea that I was writing something which I truly believed in. So I had to find some way of bringing these two things together. And I, right now I feel like I am comfortable with that. The music I want to write uh, as, an, as an abstraction is aligned with the preferences for what I want to do. I've sort of reached that point. And I just wanted to say that as a sort of a yeah. observation on, on how things have been going for me. I think in your comment about size, how you have this player that you already enjoyed the way that they play, mm -hmm. I feel like it's a really, Maybe convenience the wrong word, but a convenient way to align your preferences with your ideas is if you have this someone in which their their style of playing or the way that they sound is already sort of resonating with you. And I think that that tends to be um, a common a common situation for 
composers who get to actually write for someone that they know or are, are able to sort of work with. And, and this is kind of a great opportunity that I think we have. Yeah, and, and that's and going back to Bo's question, that's exactly, you know, I think what I would say is the most important thing in writing this piece was about <coughs> my collaborative work with uh, uh, Peter <coughs> making this piece. It wasn't necessarily in making this piece, which I, I must tell you, I wrote in my room uh, with my daughter's car as a guide, uh, and then I sent it to him, and then he wrote back that it was okay. That was the extent of our working together. Right. But I knew his work. Yeah. Um, I, th I think we're sort of at the end here, um, and I just wanted to maybe open up the floor to Yuan Ning and Bo and ask you guys if you had any additional questions. Um, I think I think that's all what I got. Yeah, yeah me too. Okay. Well, it has been a pleasure. I thank you all for you know. Um, I thank you for the interview, first of all, which I've enjoyed. Uh, I okay. thank all of the students for making the wonderful questions and for listening to my music. And uh, uh, I'm very happy with, uh, with how this how it turned out. And I thank you very much for running it, Zach. Well, you're welcome, and I thank you. It was fun talking. I love any opportunity nowadays to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. That sounds like a good sort of final statement. We'll just leave right. it. <laughs> With that thought in our mind. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye for now. <laughs>